Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, Baal, or I should say Baal, uh, and the religion of the ancient Canaanites. That's the topic. So we're going to be talking about, uh, well, quite a few things today. So we're going to delve into the archaeology as well as the mythology of ancient Canaanite religion. Uh, so we will be talking about Baal, we'll be talking about El, uh, the mistress, of course, or wife, Asherah. We'll be talking about Yam uh, and Lotan, the seven-headed dragon serpent, right? Playing by the fearsome Anat, a sister and wife of Baal in another form of the mythology, right? We will talk about Mot. The Deathly Prince, the God of Sterility, and the Underworld. We'll be talking about Moloch uh, quite a bit. But uh, we have to have an understanding of the, the sequence of events uh, that lead up. Uh, so I kind of want to capture a, ancient Canaanite religion, but I want to go through the Bronze Age a little bit, just kind of give an overview of the various epics, so we kind of understand the context from within which uh, these gods and goddesses operate, right? So let's start a little bit with the early Bronze Age Canaan. The early Bronze Age is from uh, 3300, 3300 to 2100 uh, BCE. Uh, so this is the 11th. Now the 11th is, is um, there's lots of names for this region. So uh, this region was known as Canaan. Uh, the same region was known as the Levant, but the Levant is a little larger area. Uh, so it includes not only what is today Israel and Palestine, but includes uh, Lebanon and, and Syria uh, and Jordan, a little bit of, of, of Egypt, and of course, um, you're going to have Eastern, I should say, sorry, Western Mesopotamia, as well as Eastern Anatolia. So that's kind of the 11th area. Uh, that same region, of course, is understood as Palestine, the smaller area of Canaan, uh, and then, of course, Israel. But uh, anyway, let's go back here. So we're going to look into uh, 11th. So that means how I view it is that while we, when we talk about the Canaanites, and mostly we're talking about the geographical area that is today, uh, Israel and Palestine, the reality is the Canaanites were further up north. They go into what is now Lebanon and parts of Syria. So I'm going to include that, uh, those gods and goddesses in mythology because they all connect to the West uh, Semitic uh, gods and goddesses. Now, during the early Bronze Age, that's again 3300 to 2100, right, <laughs> BCE, um, the Levant starts to be more occupied. Uh, extensive uh, settlements uh, uh, are founded during this period of time. Uh, you're going to have Hatsor and Megiddo and Gezer uh, and uh, Dan. Now, I know a lot about Tel Dan. Uh, so we'll tell Dan about it. <laughs> tell Dan uh, is currently uh, in the northern section of, of Israel. It's near the Golan Heights. And I've had a chance to, to be there. Uh, in fact, uh, when uh, I was at Claremont and um, I was studying under Tammy Snyder, archaeology, uh, she, she's, a, she's a very wonderful archaeologist. Her area was Tel Afar in the southern part. Uh, what she wanted me to do is study Tel Dan. And so I did extensive research of Tel Dan. Um, and obviously, as I said before, I have had a chance to visit and see the site. So I will be mentioning this particular place uh, as I go through uh, the various stages of the Bronze Age. Uh, so at, at Tel Dan, uh, during this period of time, uh, you're, you, you already have a city established by around 2700 uh, uh, BCE. Uh, it reached its zenith around 2,500 uh, BCE, and um, uh, it was it was a pretty a pretty extensive population. Uh, in fact, uh, according to Iran, uh, it had a population between 7,500 
to 10,000 people uh, during the early Bronze Age. And I got to tell you, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people for those days, right? Uh, we found there pottery figurines of animals. We're not sure if these pottery figurines, if they are, we're not sure if they're toys <laughs> or they're used for cultic reasons. So uh, give you a heads up on this. In archeology, span uh, especially uh, in the area that I am delving into, um, sometimes when an archeologist is unable to identify a particular artifact. Uh, sometimes in the write-up, uh, they will say that this was used for ritual purposes. <laughs> Which is the way of saying, we don't know what it's used for. So I don't know. Uh, but uh, there could be uh, these figurines of animals are connected uh, to a uh, form of worship, but they could just be uh, toys. We find uh, 22 seal impressions of a herringbone design, concentric circles that seem to have religious significance, uh, and a human figure with the arms extended upward in prayer. What I find is fascinating, and you're going to see this a lot, is that with um, ancient Canaanite religion and ancient Israelite religion, a common form of when a person prays is they lift their arms up. And you're going to see this also in many of the images of the deities. They'll also have their arms up. But for, for we humans, mere mortals, the idea the arms are up is raised towards the sky, raised, raised towards the, the heavens, so to speak. I want to say that, I want to add that a traditional Jewish praying oftentimes was with the arms raised. And this goes into later on early Christianity. Um, if you take a look at the catacombs of Rome, you'll realize that many scenes of those who are worshiping also have their arms raised up in what's called the orantes, um, uh, the praying position. Um, so uh, this is an ancient, this is before, you know, you do the, the kneeling and praying kind of idea. I mean, you do have that. But this is the typical kind of worship. And so we do know uh, from various images over the centuries that ancient Canaanites typically uh, would pray with arms raised up. Now, uh, we there's other cities that were significant. You have a hot sore uh, during the early Bronze Age that was founded around 2700 uh, BCE. It was very small. Uh, town during the early Bronze Age, it gets bigger during the Middle Bronze Age, but there is this unusually uh, large structure uh, that we're not sure what it's used for, and many people have interpreted it as used for religious purposes. Once again, we don't know. Uh, you also had ancient Gezer, uh, around 3000 BCE, it rises a little bit, uh, and uh, with caves cut out of the rocks. Uh, it was a small, unfortified settlement during the early Bronze Age. But Megiddo, Megiddo was different. Megiddo, as in the, the Valley of Armageddon, right? <laughs> Megiddo. Megiddo was interesting because uh, it's located near a spring, but it is in a perfectly strategic area uh, along this narrow pass that uh, connects uh, the hinterland with the sea. In fact, uh, this pass, this, this passageway, leads to a route, say roughly a road, that leads to Mesopotamia, okay, to the Fertile Crescent area. So people who are moving from uh, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, across, will use this passageway uh, to reach the sea, because to the north and to the south, uh, there are mountains. This is the pass. Now, when this route hits the sea, it goes in two different directions. It goes north uh, towards Asia Minor, which is Turkey, and then on to Europe. And it goes south uh, towards Egypt, which is known as the King's Highway. So it kind of forms, uh, you know, kind of a Y, right? And so this is very, so if one who controls this narrow passageway, they have the power. 
Uh, and so as a result, uh, this is a location of many of the greatest battles uh, in world history have occurred in this particular area. Uh, it came to be um, thought that one controls this pass, one controls the Middle East. And uh, this was believed for a very long time. I mean, you do have a you do have a great battle, of course, uh, between the Egyptians and the Hittites uh, near, near Kadesh, which is near Megiddo, in the same Jezreel Valley uh, that occurred uh, you know, during the time of Ramses II, which is during the 1200s. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it was pivotal back and forth. But you had other battles that occurred uh, beyond that. Um, over the course of, of history, uh, going uh, into the time of the Persians, going to the time of Alexander the Great, uh, moving in uh, to the time of the Romans, uh, going on uh, to the time of when uh, the, the Byzantine Empire moving into battles there, uh, big ones, pivotal ones, uh, during uh, the, uh, the Arabs when they arrived in this area. Uh, then, of course, battles during the Crusades, uh, and then all the way up until World War I. Um, and so doing archaeology in this area, it's just like a big pile of weapons. <laughs> so you want to know everything about weapons being used over a period of time, you just, you, just, uh, you know, uh, do archaeology uh, around, uh, the, uh, around this area, around Megiddo, uh, this particular area. By the way, Megiddo is a city site. Right. But uh, later on, people were thinking, you know, so many battles occurred here over the centuries. Why not the final battle to end all battles? The valley then becomes the location for Armageddon. So uh, so the Jezreel Valley, the, the, you know, the Valley of Armageddon, it's one and the same. And yes, I have been there. Well, what's interesting about this is Megiddo which from that word we get Armageddon. Uh, it was, of course, uh, occupied as early as 5,000 BCE, and you would think so because, hello, um, it's so strategic by the Yarmukian altar, which has many female figurines, uh, quite a bit. Uh, it seems almost like a, um, uh, not a matriarchal culture, but at least egalitarian, followed by the Wadi Rama uh, culture, but during the early Bronze Age, uh, this area was fortified. Uh, there was a palace there, but we're here about religion, aren't we? There was a temple. I wish we knew uh, what that temple was dedicated to, but it was one of the largest temples in the entire Near East at that time. It was 47.5 meters by 22. It's basically covered 1,100 square meters. That's pretty large for a temple at that time. In fact, um, on average, most temples at this time are were about 100 meters. So think about that. 100 meters as compared to 1,100 meters. So whoa. <laughs> Is a great edifice and uh, dates from the early Bronze Age. So you can understand that the uh, large city early on, strategic, everybody, everybody wants it. And right there, the role of religion comes about. Now, while we can't tell you what who they worship, we know that animal sacrifice was heavily in evidence. In fact, uh, uh, they have found. Uh, two long corridors along the main structure that are full of bones, lots of bones. Now, interestingly enough, they didn't remove the bones. They just kept accumulating in these two corridors. So the bones were stored here for some reason. Some people believe that after the sacrifice, the bones were still considered holy or sanctified and so it was wrong to throw them out however they did sort of dispose of them in another way uh and we have archaeologists have taken a look at this and so um we know that 80 percent 
uh, of these bones are young sheep and goats. The last 20% are cattle. There are no human remains. But the Western Corridor uh, is filled mostly with limb bones. Just the limbs. Oh, but just arms and legs. Uh, and we see on them these cut marks. And so perhaps they're being prepared. Perhaps the limb bones is what people are, are consuming in a sacred dining context. Why am I making such a big deal of this? Because the bones in the Eastern Corridor, uh, there's evidence of them being burned and they're not limbs. There's hardly any limbs at all. It's filled with, the majority are heads, skulls. <laughs> so you got skulls. So you got limbs in one corridor and skulls in the other. And yet they're preserving them while they're burning, but there's the heads. So what is the significance? Once again, we don't know. But uh, uh, when you approach this great temple, there's a path of basalt blocks that led to the entrance. There's an altar that was opposite of it. Um, it, the, the had, it had 12 columns along the um, long uh, rectangular um, uh, 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 long -looking axis. Um, by the way, uh, the around the columns, each of the stones made about a ton. I mean, so we're talking a massive structure. And so for me, that tells you that, well, whatever the religion, or I should say the God that was worshiped there in the early Bronze Age, uh, it was pretty significant very important and it was one of the largest temples in the entire near east uh, at that time i've seen it so i'm smiling because it's pretty big okay anyway uh let's move on so uh meanwhile uh in the what's called the basor valley uh, called and basor uh which is the southern section of 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 canaan uh, we, we take a look, and the Egyptians are actually moving in. Uh, what most people don't realize uh, is that the Egyptians, for a period of time, and they'll do it again, but during this period of time, uh, during around 3,500 to 3,000 BCE, the Egyptians uh, start to expand uh, into the southern part of Canaan. Uh, we have found, uh, you know, um, uh, for example, uh, the Egyptian pharaoh Narmer. We have found uh, the cartouche of bats and a fragment of a wine jar connected uh, to uh, Egyptians. And they basically had this area for about 200 years. They're going to get it again later on. And the reason why they're there is because of the copper and the vitamin uh, from the uh, around the Dead Sea area, as well as various minerals. So the Egyptians are there. Also, the highlands of Palestine uh, had uh, quite a, was really fertile, uh, fertile at this time. And so uh, the Egyptians used it for the harvesting of various fruits, nuts, and vegetables. I know you go to the Araba region today, and the Negev area, and it's like desert, but it wasn't then. At that time, uh, it, was, it was fertile. Uh, it was it was nice. So now, when it comes to the the first time we mention uh, the first mention of Canaan, let's go there. When was Canaan first mentioned? The area we find that in the Ebla tablets. The Ebla tablets. Now, Ebla, as I told you, I'm, I'm including under the Levant and under the Canaanites. I'm including Syria in this conversation. Uh, Ebla was a city that thrived the third to the second millennium BCE. It's 34 miles southwest of Aleppo, uh, and it, it thrived in the early Bronze Age. Uh, in fact, at that time, it had power over much of northern and eastern Syria, uh, but it was destroyed for the first time around 2200 BCE. So uh, what happens uh, is that well, we have an archive. See, these tablets uh, were discovered from an archive that preserves 1,800 
complete clay tablets, as well as 4,700 fragments. And so what happened, uh, I think this is interesting, it was actually preserved as a result of the destruction of the archive. Now you're thinking, what? You know, today, of course, we use paper, and when they destroy, people destroy things. It's the paper goes up in flames. But what happened uh, in, in the Ebla uh, situation is that the tablets were on clay, and they're on shelves. And during the fire, the wooden shelves collapsed, and the clay tablets fell into the fire. It actually baked them and preserved them to this day. So uh, it acted like a kiln. <laughs> so, uh, so these are preserved. And within this archive, we find the first mention of the all-high Canaanite sky god, El, at this time. That's before the, the, the archive ranges between 2500 to 2200 BCE. And so, yeah, we have reference uh, first time to El. Uh, the second, uh, another god that is mentioned in the, this archive is Baal. And finally, Asherah. So already between 2500 to 2200 BCE, we have mentioned of El, Asherah, and Baal. Okay. But we also have reference uh, to one who is known as the Lord of Ganana, the Lord of Ganana. Oh, and uh, in the archive of Ebla, uh, this is referring to a god by the name of Dagon. So Dagon is mentioned. In fact, uh, he is known as the Lord of Ganana. Uh, he's understood as a god of grain uh, at this time. Now, it's interesting because ganana is a very variation of another word that is kanana. And kanana, uh, obviously, uh, is the beginning of the word kanan, kanan. Got it? So it's ganana, right? Kanana. And then kanan. And we say kanan. So that's. It is mentioned there in this archive. Now, it looks, to, it appears that Dagon, uh, not El, was the most important uh, deity uh, in, uh, in Ebla. But uh, there you have it. Dagon was known as the Lord of Canaan, the Lord of the land, the Lord of the gods. He was quite a bit. Okay, so let's move on. This is interesting, right? We're moving on to the Middle Bronze Age Canaan. Middle Bronze Age Canaan, uh, it's 2100 to 1550 BCE, so 2100 to 1550 BCE. This is the Middle Bronze Age. The Middle Bronze Age, uh, you have an extensive amount of writing. So we, you know, I know that a lot of people they think, oh, you know, oh, we don't have much about any of this. We just have the Bible. I, I guess I got some surprising news. We know a lot about it and so much more uh, than those what is written in the Bible. Uh, we're talking about it all the time. It just we don't have uh, conversations about it. They're not as popular uh, when it comes to lectures. So I'm glad you're all here uh, listening up. So after the archive of Ebla, the next reference to Canaan arrives by way of what's called the Mari letters, from uh, dating from around 2000 BCE. Uh, the city of Mari uh, was an Assyrian outpost, early Assyrian outpost in Syria. Uh, there is a reference, one letter written by Mutibisir to Shamji Adad the first, who reigned from uh, 1809 to 1776 BCE. He was the king of Assyria. He writes, it is in Rasu that the brigands, which is the word is Habatim, and the Canaanites are situated. Ah, so we have, now the actual word is not quite Canaanites. Uh, it is 
uh, I'm going to spell it in, with 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 uh, Latin letters. It's K I N A H N U M. So it's K N U M. So, but we're getting there, you know. So you see the gradual evolution. The Canaan is there. The question is, we're not sure if it refers to people who are indigenous or people who are invading. We're not. Not, we're not sure about the context there. So during the Middle Bronze Age, hey, we're back to Tel Dan. Hey, hey. Um, we take a look at it, and uh, there's again, um, uh, there's a period of time of not much going on, and then suddenly things start to happen in Middle Bronze Age 2A, between 2000 to 1750. Uh, so a thriving settlement. It wasn't called Tel Dan at that time. It was known as Leish. So we have found uh, four skeletons were found inside uh, one of the tombs uh, that had a basalt roof. We found ramparts. Now, when I talk about ramparts, because during this period of time, uh, fortifications appear all over Canaan. Thick fortifications. Many of these are connected to those known as the Hyksos, H Y K S O S, who would later on invade Egypt and will dominate during the Second Intermediate Period. They'll be defeated by Othmos I in the New Kingdom. But, um, but yeah, so you have one of these mighty uh, structures. And I'm going to describe, it's, it's amazing. Again, I've seen it uh, in person, and I'm, I'm really impressed. But uh, the ramparts, so here, the ramparts are characterized by a stone poor construction of rough stones meant to support the steep incline of earth. Thus, the stone core was 6.5 meters thick and reached 18 meters in height from base to top. The foot of the outer embankment is about 27 meters from the core. The earth was built up against this core, alternating layer by layer um, with reddish brown soil and debris of earlier occupations. The layers were further sealed by a layer of travertine materials and served to protect the rampart. <laughs> What's interesting is this rampart was approximately 40 degrees, which is really uh, steep. <clears throat> it's a very steep earthen uh, defense system. And so but well, we're going to see others of this type all around. Uh, the ones, especially in the southern area, like in Jericho, are connected to the Hyksos, who are becoming more warlike, more warlike Canaanites. Now, I do talk more about the Hyksos by themselves uh, in another lecture that is posted, so you can listen to that. I don't want to spend too much time on the Hyksos because that's another conversation. They are connected uh, to the Canaanites. There's also something else I saw for my, myself and then it collapsed. Uh, what they found was a triple arched gate. That's right. Uh, they first found it near the ramparts in 1978. Uh, 1979, they started excavating it. 1980, it was exposed. I got there. I first saw it in 1986. It's an arch, a real arch. I know you see the Etruscans and Romans. <laughs> and the arch. Well, guess what? This is a real arch. What is interesting about it? Uh, the entrance to this 3.1 meter high gate from outside the city was by way of a monumental stone steps rising from the plain below. Uh, there's a second as well as a third arch. You know, and uh, but for some strange reason, uh, and we do know why now, <laughs> is that it was used for only a few decades, although the foot traffic underneath shows some wear, so maybe a little bit longer. And then suddenly they decided to bury the whole thing and packed it with mud and everything else and sealed it. And we're going, why do they seal this? Well, later on, as the archeologists were digging, they realized that the gate the arch was in danger of collapsing and they didn't want to collapse on anybody. And so they what they did is they buried it to preserve it. Uh, of course, uh, they will many will say or claim uh, that this uh, because it was in existence during the time of, of supposedly of Abraham 
in between 1850 BCE that Abraham, if he did enter uh, and he would have gone under this, this gate. Now, what's going to happen uh, is that um, we take a look, as I mentioned before, the Hyksos, uh, they are starting to dominate this area, in general, uh, not more the southern Canaanite areas, but they are. Uh, we, we do know they're from Canaan. In fact, uh, according to the Pharaoh, uh, Thomas, uh, who reigned from 150 to uh, from 150s BCE, he refers to Epepi as a Shepton of Regenu, and that's, of course, the Egyptian name uh, for Canaan. So uh, there you have it. And they'll eventually invade, and between 1650 to 1550 BCE, the Hyksos, who were, and they still were in Canaan, will invade Egypt and expand their areas. Uh, and as a result, the Middle Kingdom of Egypt will fall. So, uh, so Canaan was pretty strong, it was pretty powerful. Okay, when we take a look also, I have to bring this up. Um, the, we have also found a large amount of dark burials of infants. Uh, and these are located beneath the floors and courtyards of houses. Uh, in fact, uh, Biran, who uh, excavated this, said virtually every excavated room of a middle bronze domestic unit contains a jar burial with the remains of a single infant, and in one case, two, no more than two years of age. Uh, Biran uh, simply closes down the discussion by saying that these, uh, quote, infants apparently died of a natural death since there's no evidence to suggest that the inhabitants of Laish engaged in child sacrifice, unquote. But the thing is, uh, a lot of scholars have looked at this, well, yeah, but there's no evidence to say that they were not used uh, for child sacrifice. There is evidence elsewhere that this, this is beginning uh, in the area uh, of Canaan uh, during this period of time. So we talked about some child sacrifice could be starting here this time. Okay, now you have the city of Hatsor, uh, which was really small before. I mean, it was really small during early Bronze Age. During the Middle Bronze Age, however, um, it reached its greatest population density by 1750 BCE. It covered 30 acres uh, and it had around uh, quite a bit uh, 20,000 people. So I know we think about, uh, you know, you know, we, we, you know, we read the Bible or we read, listen to these various stories. And we think that, uh, you know, we're sitting around in the countryside and there's just a bunch of sheep everywhere. <laughs> but the reality is, is that ancient Canaan gets, it's gets very, at times, cosmopolitan. Uh, lots of urban centers all over the place, city after city, that we keep excavating. So that's something uh, that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, there you have that. Um, also, of course, uh, we have Gezer. Uh, and Gezer was another important Canaanite city. Uh, and uh, during this period of time, it was it also became pretty large with massive stone walls and towers and protected by a five meter high earthen rampart covered with plaster, much like at Tel Dan. Um, it, there was also it's a wooden city gate. And we find something interesting. We find 10 monolithic stone steles oriented north to south. And um, let's investigate this. Uh, many will say that this is evidence for what is called a bama. B-A-M-A-H. Bama. What this is, is a high place. A uh, high place is an open air altar. Uh, it's, a, it's a shrine that's located at an elevated height. So here you have it, the example of one. So there are 10 monumental standing stones, uh, many of them 10 feet tall, most of them, oriented north and south, uh, next to a massive rectangular limestone basin. Now they have found, uh, seems to be a connection to some circular 
structures west of the site. They have also found jar burials. Now, this is a point of contention. Uh, in these jar burials, uh, they are below a plastered surface that surrounds these stones. Uh, several infants were found uh, less than a week old when they died. But some of these bodies show sign of being burnt. Uh, the way and the style uh, does look like the same kind of methodology that would, would be used later on uh, amongst the Carthaginians, who we, for the prophets, who we knew, who we do know, really did do human sacrifice. And so many will say that this is a human sacrifice, that, that the human sacrifice in connection to the consecration of this high ground. Now, uh, this problem. Now, we do know for a fact that they did human sacrifice at high places in literature and other areas. This could be an early example of it. However, William Deaver disagrees. He says it's connected to a covenant renewal ceremony and that he said that these infant skeletons uh, were there way before uh, the site was established on top. It still doesn't preclude the possibility that it, these are still uh, he, uh, sacrifices, but, you know, he just kind of goes on right there. Albright says it was a mortuary shrine. Grassier says uh, this, uh, these stones were set up uh, to mark a treaty or a covenant between 10 different groups. So 10 different groups, 10 different stones. And people argue back and forth, right? So you see this quite often. But it, this could be an indication of this. Megiddo, meanwhile, we talk, remember Megiddo had a huge temple uh, in the early Bronze Age, during the Middle Bronze Age. Uh, there is another bomb that is there, right? Uh, it was um, another high place. Sorry, another high place. <laughs> it's the first one for Megiddo. Uh, this, this high place uh, is 24 by 30 feet. It's an oval platform. I have been to it. I've walked. It's about six feet tall, so you know, so it's not as tall as I am, but uh, you know, because I'm six four and a half, but pretty tall. Uh, there's there's stairs that lead to the top. And there's a wall surrounding the structure, so there's another high place where the Canaanites worship the gods. There's yet another one at Naria uh, in Western Galilee, uh, another circular open air platform and a rectangular building nearby. So high places are popping up all over now. Uh, in the in during the middle Bronze Age. Okay, so we have of course uh, the state of Ugarat uh, is now becomes important during the Middle Bronze Age. This is the coastal kingdom that traded with Egypt and Cyprus and the Aegean, Syria and the Hittites, and and once again we take a look. It was divided into quarters. With the northeast quarter of the has a walled enclosure where there's an Acropolis having three important buildings, a temple dedicated to Baal Hadad, a temple dedicated to Dagon, and a library where many texts were also found, Ugarit texts. So now we go south into Jericho, and we see that there's yet another fortification there uh, that was connected to the Hyksos. However, it was destroyed around 1550 BCE, when the Hyksos were defeated by the Egyptians. Now, this is going to be hard to wrap, to wrap around, but what will happen is this. Here we go. So during the Middle Bronze Age, the Hyksos, who are, from, who are from Canaan, they invade, at the very end, they invade, uh, and they, um, well, and they take, well, they, they basically, um, uh, uh, during the intermediate period, invade Egypt. They take that. It take Egypt for about 100 years. Then what happens is in the late Bronze Age, the Hyksos are defeated by Athos I of the New Kingdom. And as they're defeated, the Egyptians chase the Hyksos back to Canaan. This is important for you to know. They don't stop. They continue to chase uh, these Canaanite Hyksos into Canaan and then start to conquer Canaan themselves. For much of the late Bronze Age, <clears throat> Canaan 
was under Egyptian control up until the 1200s, up until the time of Ramses II. Uh, it was under the Egyptians either directly or through client uh, kingdoms. Because, hey, and Egypt captured uh, Megiddo, right? Remember that pivotal area I talked about? They were able to capture it. Uh, although it kind of went back and forth between uh, the Egyptians and the Hittites. They're always fighting in this area, many battles. So we take a look. And yes, we have lots of sources for the Canaanites during this period of time, too. Uh, the Alactus Statute of King Adrimi, uh, dating from 1500 BCE, uh, which is, uh, he mentions the land of Canaan. The Alaka tablets uh, do give more information. And there's a few other, actually quite a few other sources as well. Now, uh, we have, of course, uh, the story of Tutmos III, uh, 1479 to 1425 BCE. He made 17 campaigns into Palestine and the Near East, exp expanding the Egyptian kingdom all the way to the Euphrates River. Uh, he thought uh, what happened is, is that the campaign was felt necessary to that most the second when the Prince of Megiddo and Kadesh formed an alliance, both of their cities, of course, located in the Jezreel Valley. This guarded the way to the sea and split off so much of air, so much of the rest of the Fertile Crescent. So they kind of uh, had this juggernaut. They had this, 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 this opening. And so what happened is Tutmos decided to attack Megiddo first, uh, leading his army into the narrow opening between the mountains. He, he says, horse behind horse, man behind man. His majesty showed the way by his own footsteps. And Tutmos was able to capture Megiddo. He created buffer states in Palestine as well as in Syria. And now, uh, later on, of course, uh, you're going to have, uh, of course, you know, you're going to have various records, right? And we have the Almarna records as well. Uh, so as a source for this period of time. Now, Tutmos III, he was able to actually capture also Gezer as well. Uh, but uh, later on, Gezer revives uh, and swears allegiance uh, to the Egyptian pharaohs uh, during the 1350s and the 1330s BCE. But what you don't know, is that Bet Shun, which is the southern part of Galilee, yes, it was conquered by Tutmos III, but it becomes a center of Egyptian power. Yes, there happens to be a Canaanite temple that's built on the summit that measures 39 meters in length, but it has a stele of Egyptian hieroglyphics, which states that the temple was dedicated to the god Mecca. But the but what happens is that we discover at, during this time a lot in the way of Egyptian remains, uh, evidence of pottery, statuary, and gods and goddesses. So Canaan is now being influenced heavily by Egyptian culture. In fact, we take a look, and it looks like the majority of the people who are living at Beth Shen, south of, of the Sea of Galilee, um, during the 18th through the 20th dynasties were Egyptians, administrators and soldiers. So, wow. Yeah, meanwhile, uh, Tel Dan uh, is, is, is thriving at a center of metallurgy and making various uh, and pottery ware. And uh, we also find a Mycenaean tomb for that time. We At, at Tel Berna, uh, we find a, a another uh, a chamber dedicated uh, to Canaanite, uh, Canaanite God. We also discover remnants of face masks that we don't know what they represent. Uh, meanwhile, what's going to happen is Ugarat will continue to be to thrive and be strong all the way to the time when the Sea People arrive. So when the Sea People arrive. What happens is that that destroys the Egyptian power. So during the 1200s, the Egyptians are defeated by the Sea Peoples. And so the Egyptians lose Canaan. Uh, also, the Hittites are kind of wiped off the map. Uh, and a group of Sea People settle along the coast of Canaan. 
and they're known as the Philistines. <laughs> uh, you heard the Philistines? Those are sea people who decided to settle down uh, what is now the Gaza Strip. Okay, so Ugarat, though, uh, falls during this period of time, but Ugarat's a great source of understanding the late Bronze Age period of time. And you wanted to have details of that religion? Well, let's go, just go ahead uh, and go there a little bit. So the religion of Ugarat is very way similar to the Canaanite system, as I mentioned before. Even though the language is different, they are still in culture so much in the way being uh, Canaanites. Uh, their chief god was El, uh, who was the father of 70 gods and goddesses of the pantheon. El's wife, the mother of the pantheon's god and goddesses, uh, was understood as Atharat or Elat, although her name also connects uh, in many ways to the name Asherah, okay? Asherah, as mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, of El's sons and daughters, Baal was most popular. Uh, he was the storm god who brought rain and fertility, uh, sometimes uh, in conflict with Mott, who is a god of death. He's a god of life. Mott is a god of death. Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, in the, according to the sources of this time, uh, he was of mild character and good humored. So let's not give him all the bad press that we always hear, right? Uh, well, he never refused what was asked of him. Um, of course, then again, at other times, uh, he might kill his father or son or cut off the head of his own daughter. So I don't know, it kind of varies. <laughs> Just make sure you get you get, uh, you get him, get old Baal, uh, uh, it, you know, um, in a good mood. Okay, although Baal's uh, offspring were El and Asherah, in some cases, it's reversed, by the way. Ogarot texts indicate that eventually Baal drove El from leading, uh, a leading place and took over his position. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so I meant to say the Baal was the offspring of El and Asherah. Um, so what happens is that we take a look. Now, accordingly, uh, there are those also known as the Asherim, who are the plural uh, of Asherah. And they're connected uh, to the Baal cult and obviously Asherah. Some people say that they are connected also as being male as well as female prostitutes. So, but, um, and that through this ritual prostitution, uh, they're able to make the crops grow. But there is still disagreement about that, right? So, um, lots of disagreement. So, we're talking about, uh, you know, we always, archaeologists always, fight amongst themselves and um we we have found so many texts so many texts here i want to read one uh, there's, there's actually one story where el becomes drunk at a feast uh, these these gods get drunk a lot and uh, he, had to be, he had to be carried home uh by his sons and, uh, and so how do you revive, you know, after you have a long day of drinking, you know, you have to be a god L and you're drunk and you have a hangover. What are you going to do? Well, there's a special recipe to get over your headache after drinking. And so what it is, is you put, I'm not joking. Okay, you're going to laugh when I say this. You are going to laugh. You put, I'm not kidding the hair of a dog on your forehead and a particular plant uh, that we, it's called puk. It's put with it. And you, you and then what happens is uh, you, is, you have to put it together. And then you have a drink that mixes this with fresh olive oil. And there it is. Yes. I know it's like it's, it's not it's not, meant, it's not meant to be connected to this idea, but it is literally the hair of the dog. It's not the origin of hair of the dog, which I think is pretty funny. It's just a weird coincidence that anyway, I can resist. Anyway, this is actually from uh, Pardee, uh, a professor of Northwest Semitic philology, 
Uh, so if you don't believe me, this is academic. It's not maybe my sorts. Once again, uh, thank you, Parday, a professor of Northwest Semitic Philology, uh, for that contribution uh, to the beginning of Hair of the Dog. Well, uh, we have many texts, as I mentioned, and um, they include prescriptions of, for, for sacrifice, although they're really dry to read. And I do have them here. I'm not going to read them. I'll just read a, a U uh, is to be a, we don't can't translate this word sacrifice. A dove also is to be the something sacrifice. You also as a sacrifice, two kidneys and a liver of a bull and a ram to help. It's like, it's, 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 it's all kind of broken and fragments. But what we can put together, what we can gather together is clear, right? It is clear. Uh, that the Ugarot cultic system was centered around, around bloody sacrifice, that is, the slaughter of animals uh, in honor of, of a deity. Oh, yeah, thank you for the hair of the dog. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, anyway, this, this was a regular sacrificial uh, system. And we take a look, and we realize the sacrifices happen usually during two times, um, two important times each month during the new moon and during the full moon. These are the most important sacrifices during those times. There is some sacrificial activity uh, at the second and third quarters or the beginning of the, the lunar week, so to speak. We know that. We know that in looking at the sacrifices uh, that the those Ugarat, and we see this also evidence amongst the Canaanites, they had, uh, they had a really uh, interesting relationship of how humans and the gods interrelate. And the sacrifices seem to reflect an idea that uh, these, these, these gods and goddesses need to be fed, that the blood and the meat feeds them. It vivifies them. It gives them strength. It makes them strong. So there is this feeding idea that we see also in other ancient religions, like, for example, Brahmanism, before it becomes Hinduism, we have the same idea, this feeding uh, of the deities. We see this in other traditions as well, and I think that's interesting. Also, they think it's their uh, they need to take care of these deities. They need to take care of them, um, um, dress them up, you know, and and also to communicate with them. So, so there you have it. Uh, they did have cultic meals uh, in which, um, this, which is interesting, is they, they offer up a meal which you eat, but that same meal is offered up to the deity too. And, it's, and so you are, you and the god or the goddess are sharing a meal together. And so this is understood as, as sharing in the power or the energy of the god. And the goddess, I think this is it. It's almost like this early form of a communion or Eucharist, right? Are you seeing it? <laughs> so there you have it. So, so uh, you don't just give, uh, the, you, know, you know, I know in other belief systems, of course, you, you make offerings. But it's interesting because in this case, you're feeding the god at the same time as you're feeding yourself, right? not later on or earlier on. So anyway, there's another uh, bit I'll mention here. It's from RS1002. That's my source. This tablet, it's found 1929. It talks about that uh, we as humans have something that is, the best translation is we do error or, or sin that uh, that we as we deal with anger amongst each other, and we deal with impatience, right? Well, that's no that's no epiphany, right? You know, so we do mistakes towards one another, we get angry with other one another, and we become impatient. But they have a right in which to take care of that, to bring concord, to bring people together. How this works uh, is they have. Um, Basically, they have six sections that are divided into three for the men of Ugarat 
and three for the women. So the idea is you have various acts or rights. So you have six rights, six cultic actions. Three of them are given to the men and three of them are given to the women. You guys got it so far? Yeah, I think it's, I think already I'm interested. It's like, wow, it divides men and women as equal. And they have to be those who are from within the walls, it says, of Ugaret. Then what happens uh, is that within each of those rites, they refer to certain situations where people show sin or anger or impatience. And what they do uh, is they, they, re, they resolve that. So they talk, but each of the six sections have different issues that need to be resolved. Sometimes they mention ethnic issues, sometimes uh, geographical problems, sometimes social issues. <laughs> so they mentioned that. At the end of each of the six, there is the appropriate sacrifice to fit, to appease for peace in that area. Uh, so, but only one single animal prescribed. Uh, and so it's a different one that happens to fit, one that happens to be a donkey. So, and so after you do this ritual, uh, you're supposed to have concord and peace in the city. And it's kind of cool. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> it's very complicated, but uh, yeah, you heard it here, right? So there you have it. Um, uh, so what we do, are we, so we're gaining lots of information here. Obviously, when it comes to uh, looking into the future, uh, the means uh, is through the liver. Yeah, they look at the liver. They divine the future. Uh, through the liver, uh, they're, of course, uh, specialists. What they will do is actually mark the model to tell us the result of the consultation, whether it's a yes answer or a or a no answer, along with who's prescribing this. It reminds me a lot of the of the bone oracles that we see in China. Uh, so there you have it. Um, okay. So um, there's a few other things. Uh, one more. Uh, you do have incantations that connect, uh, that are found, are connecting to protection. And uh, I will read one, and then I will move on. Okay, so first of all, uh, here's one uh, incantation. Uh, it's RS-92-2014, uh, and it goes as follows. Uh, it, it says, it reads, when... The unknown one calls you and begins foaming. I, for my part, will call you. I will shake bits of sacred wood so that the serpent not come up against you, so that the scorpion not stand up under you. The serpent will indeed not come against you. The scorpion will indeed not stand up under you. In like manner, may the tormentors, the sorcerers, not give ear to the word of evil man, to the word of any man, when it sounds forth in their mouth, on their lips. May the sorcerers, the tormentors, and pour it into the earth for Utretia, for his body, and for his members. That's the guy's name. So obviously, uh, this is uh, used for, for protection. Right? It's an interesting, right? It's an interesting one. So we'll just go into that. But. So then all of a sudden, we move into our kind of, you know, the Iron Age. And I'll just say a few things that the, the sea people arrive. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, the Egyptian power, as I said, is broken. Uh, the Hittite power is broken. The Egyptians no longer have control of Canaan as a result of that. And many scholars will say, the Israelites at this point uh, leave Egypt or join others of their group uh, and enter Canaan in around 1200 BCE. Now, I do have to say this, is that there's evidence, and we have inscriptional evidence and everything else, that show that there are Habaru, that there are those who are the Israelites have been there the whole time, but there is evidence that there are also Israelites or Habaru within Egypt. It's a little more of a mixed bag but I don't want to go into it. But still, we're not about that. It's a whole other talk. We're about the Canaanites. But but now uh, Israel, which is mentioned by name, the Meretev Stele, uh, does exist. 
because it's exactly mentioned the Egyptians do mention it, right? During the 12 to the 1100s. But uh, when we get to the time of Saul, David, and Solomon, or you don't believe that, that's fine. The idea of a monarchy, 11th and centuries. Then you have the divided kingdom of Israel uh, around, so that happens around 922 BCE. And then, of course, Israel, the northern kingdom, falls in, uh, uh, in 721 or 722 uh, under the Assyrians. And the southern kingdom of Judah falls in 587 BC under the Babylonians. Okay, so there you have it. So I'm just trying to tell you that now you have more of a mixed bag of Canaan, but you still have the old Canaanites. Well, we take a look here. And uh, when it comes to a focused, how do I say this? Uh, focused cosmology or even a cosmogony. We don't have much that is organized enough. So we do have somebody by the name of Philo of Biblios, who lived from 64 to 141 CE, and he's very much influenced by Greek and Roman thought. But he does attempt to write some kind of pantheon and cosmology and cosmogony. But, um, and, but you know, I mean, he is talking about people that he's related to, so I guess it's true. The question is, how far back does it go? But he talks about those known as the Elohim uh, or the children of El. And he said that he obtained this information about this uh, cosmology from a certain San Chumathron of Beritus or Beirut. And he said that first there was a creator by the name of Elion, who or El Eon, like El Eon, right? Huh. El Eon. It sounds like El Eon. Anyway, El Eon, who was the father of the divinities, uh, and he was married to Baruch, from which we get the name of the city Beirut. Right. The marriage uh, results uh, in, of course, offspring. One being uh, the heavens, and the other being the earth. And of course, he uses Greek names Uranus or Uranus, right, or Gaia for this. But what I, the reason why I'm reading this is there's one really interesting factor, is that there's mention of the twin mountains, the uh, twin mountains known as Tar Gazizi uh, and Thar Magai. And what happens is that these two mountains hold up. Uh, the earth circling ocean and thereby the uh, the earth so so basically you have this three-story universe you know and you have these two giant mountains and you have this encircling sea and this and these mountains support this encircling sea which is kind of abstract uh, but they're understood in some cases as pillars right and I'm thinking to myself wouldn't they be supporting uh, the concentric dome of the sky, right? You know, with the stars. But uh, you have this added idea that you have also a circling sea that sometimes is understood as beyond it and sometimes is beneath the earth. But anyway, I think he got his notes wrong. But hey, that's just me. <laughs> but there you have it. Then you have, uh, during this, there's one more factor that we have to bring in. And that is the worship at Mezaboth sites, Mezaboth sites. Now, what's a Mezaboth? This is an altar uh, for a sacrifice that's oftentimes a standing stone. That's what, it's a Mezaboth. So, for example, uh, a place known as Bethel, which means house of God, uh, you have the story according to Genesis, Jacob, had a vision of God, as following this experience, took the stone pillow, set it upright as a stone, and dedicated to this moment, to this epiphany, stating, this stone that I have set up as a pillar, Mazaboth, the word is used, Mazaboth, uh, in the Hebrew, shall be God's house. There's a Mazaboth standing outside of Shechem, connected uh, to, uh, to Joshua. In fact, we have documented as many as 142 separate 
Mazabov sites. Uh, in the Negev and the Eastern Sinai, and, and the word Mazabov appears 34 times in the Bible itself. Now, the earliest Mazabov goes way back when, standing stone, to the 11th and 10th millennium BCE, but it became very popular by the 6th to the 3rd millennium BCE. According to the Pale of Aquat, uh, in from the 15th century BCE, this is a cuneiform tablet from Ugarat, Dan El, really Daniel, is it? Dan El, father of Aquat, complained to the gods that he, quote, does not have a son to set up a Mazaboth in a temple in his name, which seems to connect to the idea that maybe it could be used for uh, to dedication for ancestral spirits. But we do also know that they represented gods, right? The idea of the gods that you could not make any image of. And so there you have it. We have found at Tel Asafai, we have found uh, donkeys as well as sheep and goats uh, that were uh, buried along with these standing stones from the early Bronze Age. Uh, so there you have it. And once again, we do find evidence like we saw at Gezer of, um, of burials uh, connected to skeletons of children. Uh, so not only Gezer has them, but a place called Tanakh and yes, Megiddo has them too by the standing stone. So it's not just that. But we also have, uh, there's a really, I'm not going to go into this, but the Phoenicians who interrelate with the Canaanites and, and who do connect to the standing stone culture, but also they, they connect to the infant burial, right? The infant burial uh, connection. Uh, it turns out that, uh, remember, uh, it is from the, the area of the, Phoenic the Phoenicians. You have them moving to a place known as Carthage and setting up right, uh, a place at Carthage. So the culture of Carthage in North Africa is directly connected to the culture of, of, of the Canaanites as well as the Phoenicians. And we know for a fact, beyond a reasonable doubt, within the last decade, proven over and above that they did do child sacrifice. We knew this before. We now have found the material remains of that, and quite a bit, pretty extensive, in places known as Hoffman Fields. So, so, and the urns are very similar to the ones we're seeing here. So there seems to be a connection there, but we do we have other places as well. The Hebrew Bible, of course, attests that burnt offerings of children was current in early Palestinian religion. We find this in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, first, I'm sorry, Second Kings. Uh, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, and Jeremiah, it says, they burned their sons and daughters. That was no command of mine. Uh, Deuteronomy and Second Kings talks about that they're the ones who make a son or daughter pass through the fire or to burn up in fire. By the way, the Bible doesn't mention any gender emphasized, no age, just that they're, 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 they're children. Having said that, <laughs> you know, I play everything. Uh, Hello, does anybody remember the sacrifice that was supposed to happen where Abraham was asked to, oh, yeah, that's right, go up to, uh, to take his first, let's just tell you, this is second born child, uh, he's supposed to take Isaac, right, up onto Mount Moriah uh, to, to sacrifice him. Last I checked, that was his kid, and he was being sacrificed, right? At the last minute, uh, obviously, you know, you got to an animal in the nettles that takes the place of its sacrifice. So, hello, even leaks of that go into uh, Jewish traditions. So, just want to mention that uh, it's important. You also, of course, have connections uh, in Jewish literature to Moloch, which we'll go into later on. But uh, there you have it. And of course, um, let's move on to specific gods. I know we're not running out of time quite yet. Obviously, we got started late. So let's go over some of the major gods now in detail. We have a really good view, I'm very happy, a real good overview of Canaanite religion and kind of all its different aspects. But let's go get more specific. Let's talk about El first. Then we'll get to, yes, Baal, absolutely. Uh, 
One of the central gods is El. His name first appears on a list of gods discovered at the Royal uh, Archive of, of Ebla. Now, he is described as being the ancient, God, ancient of gods. He is described as being the father of all gods. A bull is oftentimes representing him. In fact, uh, he, they call him the bull god. Other names for him are creator of creatures, father of the gods, father of man, creator eternal, god eternal, which is also mentioned in Genesis 21, 33. Uh, he's also known as El the warrior, father of years. And I like this one. This is interesting. Uh, it's, it's Lutpan which means he is the one who has the shrouded face that you don't fully see. In fact, this idea of him as a bull will start to kind of fade away, and L is understood as one that you, you can't make any depiction of, you can't represent, except for a Mazaboth or a standing stone. You can rep represent it that way. And so you're going to start having standing stones or Mazaboths representing uh, the god El, who is the great father god who's connected to the sky. What I think is interesting about this is most scholars do agree that Mount Moriah was a site of a Mazaboth site, and that, of course, today is the Temple Mount, where the Dome of the Rock is, and that's where the Wailing Wall, and that's, of course, where the Jewish Temple was located, both the first and the second, and the Holy of Holies. Well, that was dedicated to El. And uh, uh, but but it was also a Mazaboth site. Another one is because you have El because El is a name not only for the high Canaanite god, it is a name for the Jewish god, known as El. You got to remember that. Oh, I want to read this real quick. Uh, there is uh, a um, uh, here's a, here's a hymn. It says the Eternal One has uh, has made a covenant with us. Asherah has made a pact with us and all the sons of El, and the great council of all the holy ones with oaths of heaven and ancient earth. I thought that was beautiful. So, so El uh, has, a, has, has a, you know, is a very important. Now, there is a text. Let's go here. And I can do El. It's probably the only one you, you'll remember. <laughs> let's, tell, let's tell an El story. Uh, it's the story of Shakar and Shalem. The story goes, once upon a time, El, he came upon the shore of the sea, and he saw two women who is described as who bob up and down. <laughs> and uh, as a result of that, of seeing them bobbing up and down, uh, he became aroused. And so he invited the two women to come with him. Uh, so what does he do for his date with these two women? Well, the first thing he does uh, is he kills a bird by throwing a staff at it. So, you know, uh, for you guys, if you want to impress somebody, just take your staff, you know, you're going to go on, on a date, throw, a, throw your staff at a bird uh, to impress uh, your date. Well, no, then the birds were roasted over, the, the bird was roasted over a fire. Then he asked the women to tell him when the bird was fully cooked, and then to either uh, address him as either a husband or a father, for after that point, he will be called one or the other. Well, so they're seeing this bird being cooked and it's being roasted, and they tell him when it's done. He knew, but he, he told him, and they called him husband. He then, according to the story, lay with them. Uh, and as a result, uh, they gave birth, each one, one uh, to Shakar, which is the dawn, and the other Shalim, which is the dusk. So morning uh, and evening. Again, El was with his now wives, and he gave birth to the more gracious gods, uh, the cleavers of the sea, they are called. Children of the sea is another word. Uh, the names of, of these wives are not mentioned specifically, uh, but there's an early reference uh, to Atherat, uh, who is uh, 
El's chief wife, as well in other sources, the goddess uh, uh, Ramu, which means the one of the moon, but uh, it could be a number of them. So the names just kind of are more flexible. Okay, now according accordingly, Baal, uh, according to the Baal cycle, El uh, it goes to his dwelling is a place called Mount Lel. Uh, the word Lel means night, so he's on the Mount Night, located uh, at the place where the fountains of the two rivers at the spring uh, move out through the depths. So there you have it. So some. Now, El, according to the Bible, when Abraham first arrived in Canaan, he meets Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the priest king of Salem and accepts blessings from the God called El. So the book of Genesis does directly connect the Canaanite God, El, as being also the same in name as the Jewish God, El. Now, Salem is Jerusalem, and it is located uh, directly at Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, where I said, used to be not only just an L site, but a Mazabah site where there's a standing stone, because this is L. Now, I just mentioned this, something else. There's another standing stone site a little further on, because you have El, Elal, Allah, and one of the standing stone sites would be Mecca. You're waking up. Wait, wait, there's a connection. Yeah. This God was also known as El Yon, which means God of the Most High, which becomes a common epithet for God throughout the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so there, according to Exodus uh, 6 to 3, the first name for the God of the Hebrews was El Shaddai, where he states, I reveal myself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. But what does the word Shaddai mean? And of course, it says, he also says, and that then I also by my name, Yahweh. Well, the word Shaddai, the word Shaddai, uh, there are three possibilities. Shaddai, El Shaddai. Shaddai could mean, come from the root Shaddad, which means to overpower. So it means God, the overpower, because El simply means God. It could also mean Shada, which means God of the breasts. So, it's God that's connected to fertility. Furthermore, it could be related to the root Shadu, which means mountain, ah, or mountain dweller. And so it means God of the mountain. Now, that makes a lot of sense. So El Shaddai is God of the mountain, or mountain dweller. Uh, and you know that El is connected to this great night mountain, is he not? So, And later on, you have this connection uh, with, of course, various mountains, Sinai, for example. Now, the plural form of El, uh, and related to the word Aloha, is Elohim. Elohim is used for multiple gods, such as Exodus 23, where it states, you shall have no other gods before me. That word is Elohim. But it is also used for just the Jewish God alone, as in Exodus 3, 4, uh, Elohim calls unto him out of the midst of the bush. The word Elohim is used 2,500 times in the Bible. So I think there is directly a connection between El, Elohim, uh, and, uh, of course, the Jewish God. In fact, let's go a little bit further. I'm going to close up and we'll move on to Baal. Um, El, the word El, the Canaanite God El, which is now obviously the Jewish God, is in many Jewish names. For example, Daniel L, which means God is my judge. Samuel L, which means God has heard. Ezekiel L, which means may God strengthen him. And Michael L means who is like God. In fact, there is also Israel L, which means who prevails with God. So yes. <laughs> so you're going, huh, Canaanite religion? And 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 the Habarus or Hebrew or Jewish religion are all connected. Yes, let's talk about Baal. I didn't I'll say Baal because that's how you're supposed to say it. I didn't bail out on you, right? <laughs> I can't keep order here. Maybe I should be the bailiff. <laughs> I didn't did I say that out loud? I did. Okay. <laughs> bailiff. All right. 
So keeping order of this court, right? Okay, so the center of Baal Hadad's worship. Um, first of all, the word Baal uh, can mean Lord, it can mean master, it can mean owner, but male form. It can mean keeper, it can mean husband, uh, it can be used as any honorific title, uh, but oftentimes is connected with as Baal Hadad, and this is the sky and storm god who's connected to fertility and often referred to as El's son. Yeah, now the center of El uh, Hadad's worship amongst the Semites uh, of the Northwest uh, is in roughly Northern Israel, Lebanon, and Western Syria. Uh, it's centered around uh, various holy mountains, which we'll talk about in a little bit, right? So, um, by the way, one more thing, Baal worship is very common amongst the Israelites. It is. And we know this uh, from uh, you know, the book of Joshua, Judges, but I want to say something else. It's interesting because a lot of Jewish names have the word Baal in it, like Ishbaal, Jerubbabel, uh, Marubbabel. Uh, they all have it. And of course, you know, you have, uh, so I just want to mention that a little bit. And of course, you have the story of, of Jezebel and Ahab uh, when you have the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and you have, of course, the institution of Baal or Baal worship there. Now, as I said, Baal is very much a storm of fertility god. And um, I do have a few things on on him right here. Actually, very long inscriptions. But I don't want to go too much into this because I want to make sure we move at a good rate. Uh, in fact, um, oh, but I want to read this so bad. Okay, well, I'll just read part of it. So we do have some inscriptions on this. So he, according to Baal's message to Anat, uh, here he announces to Anat, the, the, the goddess, the word that he understands will be revealed to humanity who does not know it yet. Uh, so you have this. So now what happens, I'm going to just kind of paraphrase the document. In, the, in this narrative, this word is the message of cosmic fertility. Uh, and this will happen when a palace is built dedicated to Baal upon a certain Mount Sophon. When this palace is completed, then, of course, uh, uh, Baal will take his place and uh, he will uh, do his cosmic work to make sure that we have fertility, right? We have the blessings. Uh, now, um, there is a description here, I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, that Anat describes the cosmic connection between the heavens and the deeps uh, in connection to this cosmic fertility. Uh, so you have this. Now, now what happens is uh, uh, he states, for I have a word I will tell you, a message I will recount to you, a word of tree and whisper of stone, the verse of heaven and earth, of deeps to the stars. I understand the lightning heaven does not know. The words humans do not know. The earth's masses do not understand. Come, and I will reveal it in the midst of my mountain, divine sapin, in the holy place on the mount of my possession, in the pleasant place of the hill of victory. And so uh, beautiful, right? I mean, just beautiful. So, okay, so uh, you do have, we have found a stele that depicts Baal as the king of the gods. Uh, it was discovered at Ugarat. And Baal is seen unleashing a storm. Uh, he's holding a club in his right hand and a spear in his left. And it looks like a lightning bolt, which extends upward in the form of a tree. Uh, and so it looks like it's becoming a tree. So he has this power of fertility. You know, the metaphor is that uh, the sprouting plant alludes to his effects upon the rain. You know, we will get, uh, of course, uh, fertility as a result. He is shown wearing a beard. Uh, he has a horn headdress. He's clothed in lion skins. Uh, the stele dates sometime between the 18th and 15th century BCE. Uh, and so there you have it. So it's a, a Mount uh, Sapan. Uh, is so therefore is a center part of his worship of Baal Hadad. 
Now, it is currently Mount Acra, and it's located directly along the Turkish and Syrian border, right there. This is the place where the great storm god made his home upon the peak. It was here that he was said to have built his mighty palace, all constructed of silver and blue lapis. Uh, myths tell how from its peak, Baal Hadad often shot his lightning bolts down upon Yama, the god of the sea, and Mot, the god of the underworld and death. Now, the goddess Anat was also worshipped here. Uh, but even before the Canaanite occupation, we know that Mount Acre was sacred to the Bereans. Now, uh, the Israelites uh, call Mount Acre Zephon. And according to Isaiah 14, 13, this is where the Canaanite gods were believed to assemble. Um, because of its location at the very northern edge of Israel, uh, it is sometimes called Mount North because that's the very northern section. There you have it. Uh, so very important. Now, this mountain later on continues to be venerated. Uh, in fact, uh, we see that the, the Greeks worship Zeus of Mount Caseos. Caseos is another name for Mount North, for Mount Zaphon. Uh, so you have the Greek king Seleucus the first climb this peak seeking advice from Zeus to where he should locate the future city of Seleucia. The Roman emperor Trajan was spared from death uh, after an earthquake uh, in the city of Antioch uh, in 114. So he went up on top of this mountain to give thanks to Zeus. Uh, in fact, uh, he even minted, uh, uh, so he even minted uh, points showing this event. And of course, you have Hadrian, uh, it's said to go up here, the Emperor Hadrian. And the story is, is that when he gave, offered his sacrifices, lightning came down and consumed his sacrifice. So, you know, something happened. Even the last pagan Roman emperor, uh, Julian, 363, had ecstatic visions of Zeus Cassius upon this mountain. Well, it is, but here's the problem. It's on the, it's on the border uh, between Turkey and Syria. So, it turns out this is an archaeological treasure. Absolutely. In fact, so much worship happened at the top of this mountain. The depth of ash and other debris goes as high as, hold your breath, 26 feet. 26 feet of debris from all the worshiping at that site. And uh, also being about 180 feet wide at the very top. However, only the first six feet have been excavated up uh, down to the Hellenistic level. The rest has not been excavated. Why? Because it's off limits. Why? Because it's a, the, the, it's a border between Turkey and Syria. So hopefully when there's peace someday, we can learn more about this great mountain. Another mountain that's important uh, to uh, uh, Baal is Mount Hermon. Yeah, another one. And so upon its summit, also it is said that uh, Baal had his palace. Uh, there's, a, there's about 30 documented temples that dot Mount Hermon along with other altars and holy sites. So this is another important place. In fact, I'm going to say something. That's, for me, it's exciting. Um, so th they, they have found at the very top uh, what's called Kassar Antar. Uh, this is the highest known temple in the ancient world. Uh, it's a rectangular building sitting on an oval. And then there is a, of course, uh, uh, this building has no, no roof. There's an inscription on it, on the limestone stele, that reads as follows. It says, according to the command of the greatest and holy God, those who take an oath proceed from here. And so many archaeologists and scholars say that Mount Hermon is the place where you make oaths, oaths that are, you know, given to the ball, right, for various things. Well, it's interesting. Here we go. Because accordingly, the Book of Enoch, which dates from the 6th century BCE, there are angels under Semjaza who take an oath 
connected with the curse to take wives from humanity, the daughters of men. This oath, according to the book of Enoch, identifies Mount Hermon specifically as the place where the oath occurred. So, wow, so you have a connection to it with the book of Enoch. Isn't that great? Other gods were worshipped here as well, like Pan by the Greeks and the Romans uh, too. So there, and then finally, of course, the third, I think a three mountains is pretty great. Uh, Mount Carmel is also another location uh, of the worship of, of Baal, another high place in the 15th century BCE, Tutmos III, lists Carmel as a holy site for sacrifice. So the Egyptian takes over this area, lists it as a place of sacrifice. Uh, uh, there is a there was an altar here. Uh, that was, of course, uh, connects to another story. Uh, you guys remember this? According to 1 Kings 18, Yahweh and, and Baal were to prove themselves by lighting the sacrificial fire before them on, Mount, uh, on, this, on this particular mountain, right? On, on Mount Carmel. So what happens is Elijah, so it's kind of a contest between the prophets of Baal uh, and Elijah. And so they have two altars, and the idea is, is that whoever's the strongest is the contest is going to light the altar. So uh, the Baal worshipers, the Baal prophetesses, uh, they go on for a long period of time praying, and nothing happens, according to the story. Meanwhile, um, um, what happens here is, is Elijah even drenches his altar with water. Uh, and so uh, and then the end, when they supposedly give up, and then he calls to God, and the, the altar is, is lit from above. So this is the place where that supposed contest occurred. So there you have it. Uh, this place, by the way, was also sacred uh, to the Pythagoreans as early as the 6th century BCE. Iamblichus, uh, the Neoplatonist, also visited Carmel. Okay, let's do one more. Because otherwise it'd be remiss. Although I do have a few others, but I want to make sure. I think we did ball pretty good. <laughs> so let's make sure we do Asherah. Okay, Asherah. According to the Bible, <clears throat> a wooden pole symbolized a sacred tree representing the god Asherah. Canaanite religion venerated trees as goddesses with female figurines, sometimes even having a tree or branches of a tree etched between their navel uh, and pubic triangle. And we find this as early as the late Bronze Age, right, at various places. Outside the biblical texts, her name literally appears in much earlier Akkadian texts uh, as the goddess Ashratim or Ashratu, as the god, the wife of the god Anu, and the Hittite texts as Ashadu, Based upon the iconography, two animals often flank Asherah or a tree representing her. And if she is in human form, anthropomorphized, she is feeding each of them with bundles of grain. According to Canaanite beliefs, Asherah is the wife of El, as especially evident in the Ugarat texts. According to these sources, uh, she is the Lady Atharat of the sea. Uh, she is also she who treads upon the ocean. Uh, she is sometimes understood as Kwanyatem Elam, which means the creatrix, creatrix of the gods, or wait, Elohim. Wait, wait, Elohim again? But I thought that was used for connected to El, Elohim. Do you know that Elohim is a a, a a feminine plural. Okay. Oh, is the masculine plural. Okay, I'll just move on pretty quickly, running quickly. Uh, so according to Second Kings, King Manasseh of Judah placed Asherah in the temple. And most scholars believe that it stayed there. This image of Asherah stayed there until King Josiah removed it here from here in Second Kings 23, 6, and 7. What is interesting about that is that it looks like there was an image of Asherah in the Jewish temple 
uh, for quite a few decades, quite a long time, maybe 40 years. Wow, long time, you know? As far as archeological evidence is concerned, uh, we find uh, the worship of, of uh, that, um, we, we find that there are standing stones that, uh, that uh, have inscriptions as well as other places that mention the name Yahweh and his Asherah. So we have here that Asherah can also be understood uh, as the wife of Yahweh as well as El. Uh, there are other inscriptions that invoke Yahweh along with El and Baal and Asherah. One declares, I'll just read a few, why not? Uh, uh, Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. Another says Yahweh of Timon and his Asherah. Uh, her worship was also evident in Arabia, uh, where there is a standing stone precisely dated to 549 BCE, which has an Aramaic inscription discussing Psalm of Mahram, uh, and talks about Asherah uh, in connection to that. So, wow. So, yeah, there you have it. Now, I'll say this. There is a point of controversy where there is an Ur that was discovered at Lakish and has an image of a seven-branch tree that dates from the 13th century BCE. Uh, and, um, and most agree that scholar, this is an image of Asherah. It's, but it's a tree, it's an idealized tree. Uh, and I wish I had a pen on me, but I'll just draw it out. So you have, you have the stem, and then it goes like this. Zoop. Zoop. And it's seven branches. It looks very close to the menorah. Very close to the menorah image. A lot of people are thinking, you know, is a menorah connected to the idealized tree of Asherah? This has been part of the conversation going back and forth. Whether you agree or disagree, that's not the point. This is just part of the conversation. And that the menorah is connected uh, to an earlier tradition. Of course, uh, of course uh, uh, Baal and Asherah were often uh, sat together, uh, you know, put together, and judges. 625 uh, tells how Gideon was commanded to pull down the altar of Baal, which your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Of course, graven images in general were forbidden, as noted by Jeremiah 227, which declares, who says to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone, you gave me birth. What is noted by many scholars is a reversal of roles. The tree is connected with the goddess, while the snow is often connected with the more masculine. So, you know, there's some interesting things going on there. And woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake to a dumb stone, arise. Uh, can this give revelation? And so forth. Now it appears uh, that um, uh, there's an evolution here, but I want to mention this one more thing. Asherah is connected to mountain too. You guys ever heard of the Mount of Olives? <laughs> so as it turns out, uh, the first mention of the Mount of Olives uh, there is, of course, a connection in Second Samuel when David is fleeing Absalom. Uh, David went up to the upset of the Mount of Olives. He went up, found refuge here. But this became the place uh, for uh, when King Solomon had his many wives, and for four wives who worshipped various uh, various gods. This was the site where they worshipped, uh, act specifically on the southern slope. We also find evidence that Asherah was also worshipped on the southern slope of the Mount of Olives, which is interesting because there's an olive grove there that was considered sacred. So sacred, in fact, that it is from that olive grove that uh, they pressed the olive oil for the Jewish temple. So, you know, even after the, uh, uh, you know, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, after the, the, the Hashemites, uh, sorry, after the, excuse me, the, um, uh, the Maccabean Revolt, uh, after the Hasmoneans, the Maccabean Revolt, uh, you have, of course, uh, you know, have the situation where there's not enough oil. So it takes a little while uh, to make it. 
well, that oil that was being fixed so that it could be, you know, after eight days uh, was from that same area. So there you have it. So uh, it is also mentioned that Asherah in 2 Kings 23, 6 or 7, uh, these poles were clothed in certain ways. And so there you have it. Okay, so I'm going to close up, but I do want to refer to two ones more, two more, just two more quickly. Otherwise, you'll be happy with me. And I got to mention, well, quickly, I'll mention Dagon. And quickly, I'll mention uh, Yom, because I, I need to mention Yom. Uh, so uh, Dagon, uh, he was a grain deity, also connected with fish. In fact, his name probably means grain itself. He's first mentioned in 2500 BCE in the Mari text. Uh, Dagon was worshipped by the Amorites uh, and those of the people of Ebla and Ugarot and by many Philistines. Uh, Dagon was, uh, in many cases, the head of uh, quite a few pantheons amongst the Syrians. So there you have it. Uh, of course, there is um, the, the story of the Ark of the Covenant. If you're familiar, 1 Samuel 5, 2 through 7, uh, when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines and taken to Dagon's temple in Ashdod, this is the Gaza Strip, the following morning they found the image of Dagon, uh, Dagon lying prostrate before the Ark. They set the image upright, but again, on the morning of the following day, they found him prostrate before the Ark, this time with the head and hands severed, lying on what's called uh, a mukhan, which means either threshold or podium. And so uh, there you have it. And so Dagon is connected uh, there. Yom is the god of the sea, who is very much part of the primordial chaos, always raging behind various storms, causing disasters. He was also known as the Judge Nahar, or Judge River, right? He is also one of the Elohim, or the sons of El, uh, and so he's also known as the Leviathan. Uh, there's, there's, it's interesting because uh, the part of the root of the name Yom, we find variations of that as Yah, which sounds a little bit like Yahweh. And there is a lot in the way of a contest between Yom and Baal, which is fascinating because you're going to have a contest between Yahweh uh, and Baal, as, you, as we see with Elijah on Mount Carmel. Carmel excuse me. So there it is. Um, now, there is a story, because uh, he's known for his chaotic ways. The Canaanites told one story where he was thrown off the sacred mountain of Akra, the one we just mentioned, you know, uh, of, of, of Mount North. Uh, so uh, the story is Baal, Hadad, and Yah were immortal enemies. Uh, uh, with the Baal epic having one story telling how Yom wished to take Baal Hadad's place uh, as the king of heaven, but in the ensuing fight, both kill one another and both are in turn resurrected. The battle between Yom and Baal Hadad uh, is, it, we have equivalents in other stories like the uh, Tiamat and Abzu amongst the Mesopotamians, and, as well as the Hittite um, serpent Yoyankas and the sky god Tisheb. How about Typhon and Zeus? Lots of connections here and there. Uh, the seven-headed dragon, Lopan, is associated closely with him and Yom. Uh, in fact, uh, they are both described as they, the serpent, right? So there you have it. Lopan is sometimes understood as the servant of the serpent. Now, wow, well, I do have also one more. You do also have Mott, who was the god of the underworld and death. So Mott uh, lives in the city known as Myri, uh, having a pit as his throne, and filth, it is said, is the land of the heritage. But Baal Hadad warns them that you shall not come near to divine death, lest he made you like a lamb in his mouth, and you both be carried away like a kid in the breach of his windpipe. <laughs> According to Habakkuk and Job, the Hebrew word for death, mawith, 
is sometimes personified not as a god, but as a devil or the angel of death, and has certain connections uh, to the word mot. There is a Phoenician account that survives uh, in a paraphrase by the Greek author Philo of Biblos by Eusebius, who writes of a Phoenician historian, uh, tells about uh, account of the death, uh, uh, that the death is the son of El. He is counted as a god. Uh, and it says, um, El, and not long afterwards, he consecrated after his death another of his sons called Mut, uh, whom he had by Rhea. This Mut, the Phoenicians esteem, is the same as Thanatos, death, as well as Pluto or Hades. So Mon is connected with Hades in this case. Uh, there is also stories of uh, philosophical perspectives uh, that. Uh, that Mott was produced uh, out of mud, but that he was uh, connected to the water compound and that from it is a germ of creation and the generation of the universe. So, so you have him connected to death, but also resurrection and life and mud. Mott was also understood as the dragon from under the earth. And he ruled a great dark kingdom of death. He was said to have a tail of a scorpion. In fact, the name Mott, as I said, does mean death. So picture Mott, uh, this dragon from under the earth, and he has this great stinger. Well, remember, Mott was still uh, being worshipped even into the first century CE. And so it's interesting because Mott is known to have this great giant mouth, as I just read to you, that swallows up the living. Now get this. Uh, you have the Apostle Paul, you know, that talks about the fact uh, that uh, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. But he also talks about maybe it's Stinger because he states that death will be swallowed up in victory. But he also asks, Oh, death, where is your sting? So those who are reading this will go, oh, this, of course, this is referring, in a sense, to Mott. And, of course, you have this also uh, in Isaiah. You have the idea that God will swallow up death forever. So it's the idea of the reversal concept, right? That uh, as death swallows up those who are living, uh, God is going to swallow up death itself. Uh, I think that's... That's rather, that's rather interesting. So that is Mott, the god of the underworld, the god of death. And then, of course, you have Anat. She's the war goddess, rather violent. And um, this will be the last one, Anat. She's uh, sometimes understood as a sister of Baal Hadad and sometimes understood as his lover as well. She's very fierce. She's a wild warrior. In battle, uh, she's oftentimes, yes, uh, walking through blood, and she cuts off people's heads, cuts off the hands, and she takes these heads, and she ties it to her torso, and she takes the hands and makes it into a sash, and she drives out the old men and town folk uh, at, uh, uh, with her arrows. And she does all this. Unlike Sekhmet, unlike Kali, she does this with her heart full of joy. <laughs> oh, so she does. She's pretty, <clears throat> she looks like Kali. Uh, she looks like Sekhmet in many ways, but there is a very big difference. There, of course, are so many other gods and goddesses uh, in connection to Canaanite religion? So many, too many. But I think I gave you some of the most important ones, as well as providing a historical context, understanding Canaanite religion. And you can see how some of these ideas not only go into Judaism, but also go into Christianity as well. So thank you so much, and have a great night.
Wow, that was excellent. So, so just a little bit of material. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, it's uh, like 10 o'clock. You I know. And I, yeah. I have, you know, I you had so you. much material though. You just, like yeah, and I'll, and I'll have to tell you, I got halfway through. Wow. So there's a whole nother lecture in there, huh? But, but uh, part of it is pretty great is that I have I have a whole bunch of inscriptions that I have here the of, of uh, that goes into some of the pronouncements and some of the stories. Um, yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty fun. I have to have the whole story of the battle between uh, Baal and 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 Yom written out, you know, and how they duke it out. So that's pretty fun. But um, any questions? Did I answer all the questions? Must have. Have I done There's it? Nothing in the chat about a question either. No. Yeah. So, well, what I could do <laughs> is is what I could do just for fun mm -hmm. is all this as just, just, just for your own entertainment. Um, uh, maybe I'll read a little bit of some of the inscriptions. Would you like that? Would that be okay? Would you be interested in that? Yeah. I know we'll, we'll lose people, but um, I think it's still would be kind of fun right there. So, okay, so I'll, I'll go here. Just, you know, this will be reading time with Dr. Riefeld of primary source texts. And let's see, I'll, I'll find a good place here. All right, here it is. I will go on. Okay, so. Hey, let's see. Actually, yeah, okay. There are the dwellings of El, the shelter of his sons, the dwelling of Lady Asherah of the sea, the dwelling of the renowned brides, the dwelling of Pidre, girl of light, the shelter of Tele, girl of rain, the dwelling of Arce, girl of Yadar. Also, sometimes else. I'll tell thee, go to, beseech Lady Asherah of the sea, entreat the creatrix of the gods. The skilled one goes up to the bellows in the hands of Casus. That's kind of the forger deity uh, connected uh, to the uh, Aeonites. In the hands of Casus are the tongs. He pours silver. He casts gold. He pours silver by thousands of shekels. Gold he pours by myriads. A glorious crown studded with silver, adorned with red gold, a glorious throne, a days above a glorious footstool, which glistens in purity, glorious shoes, a reception. Thereover he brings them gold, this forger deity. A glorious table that is full, a glorious bowl, fine works of Camarus set like the realm of Yom, in which there are buffaloes of myriads. Then it goes on. Uh, Kathar Upasas uh, goes to the Lady Asherah of the sea, mother of the 70 gods, and he offers these gifts to her. And of course, he lists the gifts. He adorns her with the covering of her flesh. She, she tears her clothing. On the second day, he adorns her in the two rivers, she sets a pot on the fire, a vessel on the top of coals. She perpetuates the bull, God of mercy, and treats the creator of the creatures on lifting her eyes. And then she sees. And then the, the, the text cuts off. There's more, but um, it's beautiful. Uh, they besought Lady Asherah of the sea, yea, entreated the creature of the gods, and it goes on and on, but it's really beautiful, and it goes on for about 10 more pages, but there's a break in one part, but so we have a lot that has survived. Uh, you get the idea, right? My question is, how come we don't know any of this? How come this is not talked about? 
how we have too much. We have so much. You would think for even for biblical studies, this would be like, you know, a class. You could teach a whole class on just Canaanite religion because there's so much, so much in the way of archaeology, so much in the way of texts. It's the wrong God, though. Right. Well, not not only that, but like you were saying at the beginning, um, that uh, vilify people for their beliefs. Yeah. Re yep. Remember when you remember when you said that, Maggie? You know, it's it's all about war and um, and control. And but the amazing thing is that. We are all of the same people. And I just bless you for bringing this to us. You really um, enlightened me. And I wish that you could enlighten the world. What part do you have to say? Yeah, Sorry. I didn't say anything. Well, the, the conversation at the beginning. Remember? Oh, okay. Oh, you mean about Latora and, and all of that? Yeah, yeah, she was, she, before we even started the class, she was talking about how war, you have to vilify somebody. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. You yeah. have to make them not human. Mm -hmm. And um, this all connects us. Could you imagine if everybody believed that we were all connected and oh, how right. amazing yeah. it would be? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but there is fight in there. They don't, there's money in religion. There's money, yes. okay? Yeah. And if you don't come to me and spend your tithing here, you know, you, and we don't educate people. We don't want you to know the truth. We don't want you to know that there is, that we're all connected because how could we separate us? Well, in order for my religion to be the correct one, all of yours have to be wrong. So there is no correct one, though. That's yeah, that, that's that's what I think. I think all of them are a little bit right. But uh, in, in order for me to be on top, you have to be lower than. And I think that's exactly. a huge problem. Exactly. Yeah. And but that's the struggle of man. It You've is been doing that for, yeah. for thousands of years. Obviously, like from the lecture tonight, we can see thousands of years we've been battling the tendency. And we still haven't learned. Thank you, James, for enlightening us. I mean, yeah. you are so amazing. What yeah, a well, lecture. And then, and then thank you, Margie, for, for giving such a wonderful context. So I'm hoping, I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, it wasn't recorded. So now, now it's, it lasts for posterity. So you keep this in, Margie. Okay. All right. We'll do. By request. So. All right. That would be, that would be good. Yes. Because yes. you know that this all goes up on YouTube. Yep. Uh, That's good. Probably, you know, early next week or something. You know, I, I try and get them up fast, but it yep. will be up on YouTube for posterity. Yeah. So, so your, your, your words of wisdom are there as well. Yeah. No. Maybe, maybe we should do an Ugarat ritual and, you know, all divide up and have the, what the, what was it, the three women and three men, right? And, uh -huh. you know, and, and divide it all up and do a ritual of Concord and bring everybody together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I love that ritual, though. I think it's a great idea. It is. I'm, 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 I'm in. That's wonderful. I'll be, I'll be at your next lecture. Thank you so much. Ages. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, so two weeks from tonight, uh, it's the medieval female mystics, right? That's what we're doing. Medieval yeah. female mystics, we're going there. Yeah, and, and as, as a closing, and as a closing note, I will just say uh, the answer to my very, very answer to the question. I threw it out there. Uh, the, uh, here's here's the situation, and you're right, uh, Patty. Uh, what happens is this: is that is that people don't want to understand the full picture of what's going on in Canaan diversity that's there mm -hmm. and as a result we lose the context of not only the canaanites but we lose the content the, the context of ancient judaism of we, humanity we yeah we, but we lost we lost and 
we got to see these things coming together. We need to understand that uh, the L was worshipped by the Canaanites, but they're also worshipped by uh, the Israelites. You know, it's the same God. You know, and El Alal is Allah. So I mean, you have right. The, and that's what I was going to say. I loved how you connected it to Allah. I mean, yeah. and um, it's it's out there. We do, we don't educate people. We educate people in binary. We don't educate people really um, for all the things to think for themselves or to or to explore. We don't think for yourself and question authority. <laughs> I just think you're wonderful, and this was you came into my life at a brilliant time. I am so blessed to be here. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, everybody that was here. Thank you Let's so much. I'm glad you could join us. We'll look forward to seeing you again. Absolutely wonderful to have you again. All right. I put in the chat all the forthcoming events for this month. Right. Thank you, Jess, for being here too. So, so there we go.